Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 81, Key. Beside the serpentine river outside Cordu village, under the piercing sunlight, Aurora, clad in a casual blue dress, sat on the ground with her eyes closed, listening to Lumian's conjectures and analysis. She remained silent for a while, as if lost in thought. After nearly a minute of contemplation, Aurora spoke, if something truly occurred during the ritual on the twelfth night, causing the hidden entity's power to disperse and trigger a time loop in Cordu and its surroundings. I believe that the people and even the spirits in this area at that time wouldn't have been spared. What do you mean? Lumian, also seated on the ground, struggled to grasp his sister's reasoning. Aurora elaborated, I mean that it's both power and corruption. Once it disperses, everyone in this area will endure the corruption on relatively equal footing. Only those bearing the Blackthorn symbol or under the protection of other high-level entities can barely remain unaffected. Consider this, isn't it like a dam bursting, flooding the entire place up to the rafters? Unless a boat was prepared beforehand, we'd undoubtedly be drenched. Lumian envisioned such a scene and hesitantly inquired. So, does that mean everyone in the village has been tainted by the dissipating power, effectively becoming a component of the loop? By component, he didn't mean participating in or being affected by the loop. More precisely, people became part of the loop structure. Oror, her eyes still closed and her blonde hair tied up, gently nodded. I suspect that not only will killing the Padre result in a reset, but also slaying other villagers in Cordu will trigger a similar effect. It's like trying to dismantle the loop's components. There will surely be a reaction to such disruption. But we just killed the midwife yesterday afternoon. Lumian trailed off before finishing his sentence. Suddenly, numerous thoughts raced through his mind, and he hesitantly proposed, is it because the people in the castle are protected by other high-level entities? Is that why Madame Puales claimed she could leave the loop at a specific moment? She wasn't tainted by that power. She's not part of the loop. She's affected. But she can exploit loopholes or seize opportunities to escape. Or sighed softly. That's why she said she can't save us or take us with her. We've already been corrupted and are fused with the loop. At this, she managed a bitter smile. Or rather, we're already dead. We're merely existing in the form of loop components. No wonder that mysterious lady said that if she forcibly ended the loop, everyone here would die. That's because we are the forcibly dispersed loop itself. Lumian fell silent. He yearned to contradict his sister and argue that they shouldn't be so pessimistic, but her words aligned with the mysterious woman's. What he couldn't comprehend all this time was that, given the woman's ability to freely enter and exit the loop and her audacity to mention the hidden entity, even if she couldn't break the loop without causing any harm, it ought to be simple for her to safeguard two or three people and facilitate their departure. Now, there was a more plausible and disheartening explanation to this conundrum. After a few seconds, Lumian found a counter-argument. Ava, Remund, and Naroka are all dead, but their deaths didn't cause the loop to restart. Oror, her eyes still closed, offered a complex smile. Perhaps they died before the loop began, so without participating in the ritual on the twelfth night, they weren't tainted. Her implication was clear. In the timeline before the loop transpired, Naroka had perished before Lent, while Ava and Remund had been sacrificed during the celebration. They didn't survive until the twelfth night and were not part of the loop. She paused for a moment and continued, Jean Mori, who vanished today, might be in a similar situation. According to normal developments, he should have discovered something abnormal after Lent, and before the twelfth night. He wanted to escape, but was silenced. Our investigation merely expedited this event. The only thing I don't understand is that Riamun's corpse was sacrificed, right? He shouldn't have been in the loop from the start. Hearing his sister's words, Lumian instantly recalled the events beneath the cathedral. The invisible figure in the black robe was composed of Riamund and the other's spirits. Lumian combined his knowledge of mysticism and attempted to speculate. Maybe the Lenten sacrifice wasn't made directly to the hidden entity, but to the altar. It's part of the Twelfth Night's ritual, so Riamund's spirit appeared beneath the cathedral. His body is useless, but before the loop began, Pons Bennett and his associates could leave Cordu. To stop those downstream from finding the body and alerting the higher-ups, they might retrieve it after completing the ritual of sending it downriver. Once the loop started, the power had limits. It can't cover the area where Pons Bennett and the others recovered the body. They are affected by the corruption in their bodies and won't consider leaving this area. Or pondered for a moment and nodded in agreement. In the past few days of the loop, other than you, the three foreigners, and Madame Puales and her subordinates, none of the villagers have thought of leaving Cordu to hunt or gather wild fruit. If you hadn't reminded me, I would have been the same. Aura revealed a desolate, self-deprecating smile. We're already a group of monsters. We're barely surviving as humans by relying on the loop. 
No, there must be a way for redemption. That lady said it exists. Lumion interrupted his sister's self-pity. Auror exhaled slowly and stated, Can't you let your sister be vulnerable for a few minutes? She continued, Based on this line of thought, we can only rely on ourselves. Breaking the cycle with external forces is equivalent to killing us. Lumion sighed. Unfortunately, there's no way to verify this speculation at the moment. We can only confirm it on the twelfth night. We can verify it, but it'll waste a lot of our time. Besides, I can't do it, Aura replied. That's true. Lumion roughly grasped his sister's meaning and plan. Kill a villager not currently on the Padres team to see if it would trigger a reboot. If it did, they could find a way to lure one of the three foreigners into a death trap and see if it triggered the cycle. If not, it would validate Auror and Lumion's guesses. Most people in Kordu village had been corrupted and were part of the loop. Those who came later were only affected by the loop and had a chance to escape it with the help of loopholes or external forces. However, that would squander many of the past few days, and Aura wasn't the type to kill innocents, especially those they had a good partnership with. Lumion had no moral qualms in this regard. From his perspective, dying in the loop wasn't true death. There was a high chance of only residual problems. That was much better than being trapped in the loop. Of course, if he really wanted to do so, he wouldn't try to murder Lee and the others. Instead, he would reason with the three foreigners. With Valentine's fanaticism and piety, he was confident he could persuade him to commit suicide. The siblings exchanged glances and fell silent, unsure of what to say. After a while, Lumion changed the subject. Grand Sower, what do you think is the key to ending the loop from the inside? Auror had been pondering this question. As she thought, she said, we can't just end the loop from the inside. We have to use this situation to remove the corruption in everyone's bodies. Otherwise, what's the difference between this and suicide? Yes, according to my previous guess, something happened to the ritual, causing the entire village to enter a loop. And the reason an accident occurred was that you bear the mark of that great entity. It was activated and sealed the heavy corruption in your heart. Aurora assessed her brother as she spoke. Lumion instantly grasped her meaning. You mean I'm the key to ending the cycle? Aurora nodded. The source of the accident lies with you, so naturally, the key to ending the cycle is with you. Of course, this is only a guess. Perhaps the key to the loop is the vessel that will bear the power of the hidden entity's descent during the Twelfth Night's ritual. For example, the Padre or someone else. Aura suddenly fell silent and looked at her brother for a few seconds. Could these two speculations be equivalent? You are the vessel. Otherwise, as an auxiliary sacrifice and contaminant, even if something unexpected happened, the ritual wouldn't have failed disastrously, and its power dissipated uncontrollably. Uh, the more Lumion thought about it, the more he felt that his sister's guess made sense. He muttered to himself, That black thorn mark on my chest is darker than the Padre's was. So when the priest tried to deal with me, he showed signs of losing control, allowing me to kill him. Therefore, that mysterious lady never said how to end this loop. She just told me to explore the dream ruins and figure out their secrets. Aura got a little pumped. Yeah, that's probably a clue. Maybe the dream ruins stem from the corruption in your body or are closely linked to it. So you can rely on the black thorn mark to take down every monster you run into there. Once you unlock the secrets, you can rein in or safely tap into the power in your body to some extent and siphon off the corruption from everyone in Kordu. The loop will break on its own. Yeah, maybe this can only be done at certain times. Like at the ritual on the twelfth night. Lumion leapt to his feet. I'm heading back to dream now. No rush. Aura slowly sat up. Aren't you hurt? Aren't you going to rest? Lumion patted his chest. The liquid Madame Puali's sprinkled healed all my wounds and restored my spirituality. Oh, was that Pamilo Sago? Child giving Guanian. Aura muttered. Huh? Lumion didn't get it at all. His sister was speaking a totally foreign language. Aurora smiled with her eyes closed. What I mean is, go home, fill your belly, take a nap, and explore your dreams. Chapter 82, Dream Divination In the semi-subterranean two-story building, Lumion and Aurora quietly consumed their belated lunch. The mutton, which should have been succulent and tender, tasted utterly bland on their palates. Barely satiated, Lumion was about to clear the table when tinkling sounds reached his ears. Lee and the others, he glanced towards the door. Aurora, too, sensed something. She set down her cutlery and fixed her gaze upon the entrance. Moments later, the doorbell chimed. Without hesitation, Lumion abandoned his seat and strode towards the door, peering at the visitors through the peephole. It was indeed Lee, accompanied by the other two foreigners. Valentine had finally changed his attire. Previously engulfed in flames due to the sufferer's aura, Madame Puales had tended to his wounds, but his scorched clothing was beyond repair. Lumion swung the door open and greeted them with a warm smile. My cabbages, you already miss me. 
Oh, you actually can change clothes. Valentine had swapped his white vest, blue tweed jacket, and black trousers for a yellow vest, black formal jacket, and dark pants. White fabric flowers adorned Lee's white cashmere dress, one large and two small, concealing signs of damage with impressive sewing skills. As for Ryan, Lumian couldn't detect any difference in his outfit or evidence of his previous injuries. Lumian suspected the man had packed at least two identical sets of clothing. We've gathered information on those two matters, Ryan replied coolly, his eyes hinting that details would follow once they were inside. Lumian sought Aurora's approval before fully opening the door and ushering the three investigators in. This was the first time Ryan and his colleagues had met Aurora, and they exchanged polite introductions. About the impending horoscope shift, and the villagers' supposed good fortune, it's tentatively confirmed that the Padre orchestrated the rumors, Ryan revealed, wasting no time as they settled around the dining table. But I don't think it's that simple. The methods and rhetoric resemble those of a village witch. Under normal circumstances, the Padre wouldn't devise such a scheme. Village witches were part-time fortune tellers who frequented small towns and villages. Aurora nodded thoughtfully. Could it be the influence of the deceased warlock? Hum, a way to lure villagers into secretly worshipping the evil god. And they believed it so easily. Valentine seethed. His expression conveyed utter disbelief at the gullibility of Cordu's inhabitants. It's all because believing in the eternal blazing sun doesn't alleviate their poverty, and they're still oppressed by the Padre and the Administrator. Auror held her tongue, fearing a confrontation with Valentine. She could envision villagers experiencing tangible benefits from the Padre and his followers after turning to the evil god, such as reduced contributions to the eternal blazing sun or protection from Pons Bennett's harassment. They could even scare their irritating neighbors using the thug's name. In short, their lives would genuinely improve, giving them hope and fueling their devotion. Nevertheless, Orr didn't condone their actions. While the government and church primarily sought money, the cults demanded lives. Ignoring Valentine's question, Lumian helpfully suggested, you should ask the villagers yourself and thoroughly investigate the cause of their wavering faith. If you uncover the truth, I believe the papacy will hold you in high regard. The papacy referred to the Eternal Blazing Sun's Pope, a title shared by many church leaders. Lumian had recently learned this after perusing the materials Auror had procured. Valentine fell silent, evidently intrigued. Auror shifted the focus to Ryan. Did you locate Sybil's husband, Jean Mori? Ryan glanced at Lee, prompting her to speak. Lee nodded and said, We infiltrated Jean Mori's residence and obtained one of his belongings. Using this item, I performed a dream divination. Dream divination. Auror nodded, unsurprised. As Lumian recounted their exploration of the castle the day before, Auror had already pieced together their pathways and approximate sequences based on the performance of the three official investigators. Clearly, Lee belonged to the more common seer pathway in Antis. Moreover, she wasn't a Sequence 9 seer or Sequence 8 clown, but at least a Sequence 7 magician. This could be inferred from her Bayonder powers like paper figurine substitutes and damage transfer, as well as her skills in divination and acrobatics. Aura wasn't certain if Lee had reached sequence 6, as her knowledge of the pathway's subsequent stages was limited. Valentine belonged to one of the main pathways controlled by the eternal blazing sun church, the sun. Likewise, he wasn't a sequence 9 bard or sequence 8 light suppliant. Aura deduced from his holy light summoning, holy water creation, and Sun Halo that he was a Sequence 7 Solar High Priest. Furthermore, he likely hadn't reached Sequence 6 Notary, as he hadn't displayed the corresponding abilities. Ryan's Bayonder powers were uncommon in Intis, he was likely a warrior. This pathway was primarily controlled by the Church of the God of Combat from the Faisak Empire in the north. However, in the past five to six years, numerous Bayonders and Bayonder creatures of the Warrior Pathway had appeared in various countries. Several members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society had either actively or passively chosen this pathway. According to Auror's knowledge, this was also known as the Giant Pathway. Sequence 9 was Warrior, Sequence 8 was Pugilist, and Sequence 7 was Weapon Master. Sequence 6 was a level that experienced a qualitative shift compared to previous sequences. They were called Dawn Paladins, who possessed the strength of giants and could create sunrise gleam in a certain area to eliminate illusions and negative or evil energies. They could also condense full-body armor known as Dawn and weapons they were proficient with. Among them, the most potent was the two-handed broadsword, the Sword of Dawn. With the Sword of Dawn, they could unleash their sequence's most powerful attack, Hurricane of Light. This could annihilate the human body, exterminate vengeful spirits, and even wound evil spirits. Considering Ryan's performance, Aura believed he was a Sequence 6 Dawn Paladin, 
though he probably hadn't become a Sequence 5 Guardian yet. Aura had always felt that these three official investigators were on par with her. Now, she realized that each of them was stronger than the last. If she wasn't prepared, she wouldn't stand a chance in a one-on-one -on -one battle. It was well known that in the official categorization, Sequence 9 and Sequence 8 were considered low-sequence Bayonders. They had some unique abilities compared to ordinary people, but their flaws were apparent. Sequence 7 to Sequence 5 were mid-sequence, where they began to possess extraordinary powers. Sequence 4 and above belonged to the demigod domain making them worthy of the title High Sequence Bayonders. According to some members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society who had infiltrated official organizations, when dealing with ordinary Bayonder matters, a team of one mid-sequence and two low-sequence Bayonders would be assembled to carry out the first round of investigations. They would then deploy more high-level forces depending on the situation. This time, facing the anomalies in Kordu, the Intis officials had sent three mid-sequence Bayonders. They weren't taking the situation lightly. However, even this joint investigation team didn't seem to be enough for Kordu. Aura had shared all this information with Lumion, and the siblings listened intently as Lee continued. In the dream divination, I saw Shepherd Pierre Barry. He emerged with a few nails wrapped in hair and stuffed them into the hay. Lee described the scene in the simplest terms. Haystacks, nails and hair. Lumian instantly recalled his discovery under the guidance of the three sheep. He had also found some nails wrapped in hair in the haystack of the Barry's sheep pen. He frowned and said, Are those Jean Maury's nails and hair? Was he killed by Shepherd Pierre Barry at the Barry's place? Aura nodded. Originally, the custom of hiding one's nails and hair outside the house was to prevent it from affecting one's family horoscope and luck. It was limited to family members with a bad reputation or who committed suicide, as well as those who were murdered by their relatives. But because Jean Maury was killed at the Shepherd's house, Pierre Barry still carefully cut off the other party's nails and took some hair to hide in the haystack outside the house. No wonder it was there before. That must be from their previous victim. How many people have they killed in secret? Lumian scoffed under his breath. At this point, he's still worried about messing up his horoscope and luck. Imbecile. Valentine cursed aloud. They had been briefed by Lumian earlier and knew about the three sheep, the haystack, and the old folk customs they represented. After discussing for a while and confirming they wouldn't try anything else for now, Lee and the others bid Lumian and Aura farewell and return to All Tavern. The siblings didn't mention their speculations at noon, afraid it might deter the official investigators from cracking this case open from the inside. After all, they could only be affected and might escape with outside help. After clearing the table and helping wipe it down, Lumian returned to his room and lay on the bed. With conflicting thoughts and many unanswered questions, sleep eluded him for a long time. He relied on some meditation techniques to slowly calm his mind and finally drifted off. In the room shrouded in faint gray fog, Lumian opened his eyes and sat up straight. He lowered his gaze and looked at his chest. His vision seemed to cut through the thin cotton shirt and flesh, allowing him to see the black thorn tattoo and the bluish-black pattern underneath. Is this the root cause of this endless loop? Lumian thought. The black thorn symbol was at the heart of the issue, and the bluish-black pattern brought protection from that ominous force, allowing Kordu to be salvaged. All of this could be traced back nearly six years. Lumian remembered clearly that he had still been a street rat at the time. He had barely survived by relying on seeming unthreatening due to his young age and extreme ruthlessness. Then, one day, he met a dying old man. Maybe it was because he had picked up some street smarts, or maybe because the old man reminded him of his only family, Pepe, who had raised him until his early teens but sadly passed on. Lumian chose to lend a hand. Though he ultimately failed to save the old man's life, Lumian still sent him to the crematorium and buried him in a public grave. He had found the bluish-black symbol on the old man's corpse during this. From then on, he often dreamed of the vast expanse of gray fog. His luck also turned sour, and he began struggling to scavenge enough food. Thankfully, he met Aura not long after. Chapter 83, A Sudden Encounter Phew, Lumian exhaled steadily and reigned in his racing thoughts. He slung his shotgun over his shoulder and clipped on his axe. Leaving the semi-subterranean two-story building perched on the edge of the wild, he strode into the dream ruins. Tracking a familiar route through the dense forest, he crept deeper into the tangle of collapsed houses towards the hulking peak of crumbling red stone. Thick fog clung to the somber sky, weeds rasped at his feet. The whole world was darkened, bleak. Soon Lumian left familiar ground behind, plunging into the heart of the ruins. He scanned the ruins constantly, cataloging every trace, theorizing how each might be useful in a fight. Caution slowed his progress but hunting taught caution and carefulness above all. 
Finally, a clue. Fresh footprints, seemingly human, tucked behind a jumble of rubble at the road's edge, cunningly concealed. This one knows how to move unseen, capable of eliminating traces to a certain extent. Lumian observed for a while and made a preliminary judgment. He suspected that it was something similar to the shotgun monster, perhaps bearing clues to sequence aid of the hunter's pathway. Experience and Aurora's speculation told him three types of monsters likely infested these ruins. The first bore no boons or beyonder characteristics, like Noodle Man or the Mouth Orifice Monster, probably under the sway of that hidden being called Inevitability. The second displayed Bayonder characteristics but no boons, typified by the shotgun monster. The black thorn on Lumian's chest would suppress them. It meant that they were tainted by some hidden corruption, resulting in them turning into monsters. The third showed no boons or Bayonder characteristics, mere humans or creatures twisted into horrors like the skinless monster he first found. Whether monsters with both boons and Bayonder characteristics existed. He and Aura suspected so but lacked proof. Therefore, it was very likely that a monster with hunter traits possessed Bayonder characteristics. Lumian tracked the footprints and discovered two lethal traps along the way, validating his hypothesis. Had he not tread carefully or lacked his hunter abilities, he might have become prey instead of predator. Soon, the footprints grew fresher. This meant a high probability of encountering his target if he pressed on. Rather than rushing to greet his target, Lumian circled around and located an ideal ambush spot. Then he began to dance. Amid the intangible melody, he stamped with powerful steps and spun in a gentle, graceful semicircle, reenacting Noodle Man's strange, mysterious sacrificial dance. His skills were rough and rusty, but with his dancer power, Lumian felt his chest heat up. After undoing his shirt and confirming the Blackthorn symbol's materialization, Lumian climbed into the collapsed house's center and settled into his chosen hiding place. He quickly glanced into the distance and spied a figure digging a trap. It was certainly a person, but its whole body was charred black, and crimson flames blazed on its surface endlessly. No way it's a pyromaniac, right? I've landed a big one. Lumian was both thrilled and vexed. He was thrilled that the primary ingredient matching a Sequence 8 Provoker had appeared. What troubled him was that it was much stronger than the prey he had anticipated. Pyromaniac was a sequence 7 of the Hunter Pathway. According to Auror, it was a sequence that had undergone a qualitative change. Its ancient name was Fire Mage. Lumian believed that with him being a hunter, a dancer, and possessing the Blackthorn symbol, as long as he wasn't careless, hunting a provoker monster shouldn't be an issue. However, he wasn't confident against a sequence 7 Pyromaniac. As long as the monster attacked him from afar, it might not be weakened by the Blackthorn symbol. After some thought, Lumian decided to retreat. He planned to devise an effective plan to handle the flaming monster after setting up a targeted trap. His initial idea was to head home and dance the dance that could summon the strange objects in the surrounding area, and see what kind of adverse effects it would have on him when allowing the remnant spirit of the mouth orifice monster to possess him. If it wasn't severe and acceptable, he could borrow the other party's ability in the future, such as invisibility. Lumian wasn't too worried about the aftereffects of being possessed or whether the vengeful spirit would be willing to leave after successfully possessing him. In any case, he was in the dream ruins. As long as he didn't die on the spot, he could recover fully after returning to reality to rest. Just as Lumian made a move, the flaming monster suddenly raised its charred face and bulging eyes, looking right at him. Not good, Lumian thought. Instead of climbing, he jumped down from his hiding spot. Almost instantly, a massive fireball smashed into where he'd been, sending bricks and rocks flying, erupting in flames. Lumian staggered in a sorry state. When he crashed, he could barely control his body. All he could do was tumble and roll to cushion the impact. If not for Dancer's extraordinary flexibility, his muscles and ligaments would have torn from the twisted movement. By the time Lumian stood up again, the flaming monster had already materialized atop the collapsed building. Phantasmal fire ravens coalesced from flames around it. Upon seeing this, Lumian felt as if surrounded by soldiers with guns trained on him. Without hesitation, he bolted towards the collapsed building where the flaming monster stood. Faced with such a scene, he felt the only way to turn defeat into victory was by using the blackthorn symbol on his chest, and this seemed to require closing the distance. Thud thud thud. As Lumian ran, half the fire ravens descended from the sky and detonated behind him, causing heat waves to surge and explosions to reverberate. The remaining illusory fire ravens banked and locked onto their running target. At that moment, Lumian arrived at the bottom of the collapsed building, 
no more than five meters from the flaming monster. In the next second, the charred monster enveloped in crimson flames froze. The remaining fire ravens around it were instantly snuffed out. It's working. Just as joy flooded Lumian's heart, the flaming monster pivoted and fled from the collapsed building in the opposite direction. Hey, don't run, Lumian blurted subconsciously. He circled around the ruins before him and chased after the flaming monster. Lumian chased it for two blocks. As the monster was too swift, he completely lost sight of it. At this moment, the searing sensation in Lumian's chest vanished. He had no choice but to stop and adjust his breathing, gearing himself up to track the footprints and watch out for traps. As he panted, Lumian's gaze swept around and suddenly froze. Not far away, a figure loomed in the doorway of a half-collapsed building. The figure wore a black robe with a hood. Aside from that, it seemed ordinary enough, except it had three faces on its head. The front face was an old man's, milky eyes, scraggly brows, wrinkled as a prune. The left was in its prime, chiseled and stubbled, icy blue eyes gleaming. The right was a child's, one less than five years old, smooth and round, blue eyes wide with innocence and ignorance. The three-faced monster. That three-faced monster. Lumian was truly frightened. As he was chasing after the flaming monster, he'd wandered deep into the ruins and stumbled on the three-faced monster. Despite mastering the mysterious sacrificial dance and activating the Blackthorn symbol, Lumian had no intention of using the three-faced monster as target practice. His instinct screamed that this foe was lethal. According to the mysterious lady's words, even weakened by the Blackthorn symbol, the monster could easily slay a weak hunter. Lumian's plan was to steer clear of the three-faced monster's territory and practice on other monsters. He wanted to test the Blackthorn mark's power against enemies of varying might before deciding whether to hunt the three-faced monster. Unexpectedly, the monster left its domain and stumbled upon Lumian. Eh? Would a little dance of contrition perhaps appease you? Lumian thought, taking an involuntary step back. At the entrance of the crumbling building, the three-faced monster in a black robe and hood retreated a step. Lumian spun around. The three-faced monster mirrored him. Lumian bolted. The three-faced monster fled as well. Lumian, who had meant to flee and try dancing, ran a few paces before sensing something amiss. He halted and glanced back. By chance, he saw the three-faced monster retreating. Lumian stared, stunned. After a moment, Lumian vaguely grasped the situation. He touched his face and muttered, Am I that scary? The three-faced monster's actions reminded him of their first encounter. Back then, Lumian stole a glance at the three-faced monster and cowered in terror, praying to the eternal blazing sun to conceal him. Though the three-faced monster clearly peered toward his hiding spot, it didn't seem to notice anything. Instead, it took the initiative to retreat further away. So it wasn't the eternal blazing sun that shielded me, nor was I very fortunate. Did the three-faced monster sense my specialness and flee? Lumian nodded thoughtfully, hazarding a guess. In the dream ruins, can monsters of a certain level directly perceive my specialness without me half-activating the Blackthorn symbol? Chapter 84, Dirk Lumian broke the monsters in the dream ruins into three levels based on how the flaming monster and the three-faced monster reacted when they encountered him. The lowest level ones acted on instinct alone. As soon as they saw him, they would attack. When he activated or partially activated the Blackthorn symbol on his chest, they would immediately give up and submit fully to his mercy. The higher level ones would hunt him down before he partially activated the Blackthorn symbol. After he finished the sacrificial dance, they would cunningly opt to escape. But they couldn't sense the existence of the Blackthorn symbol beyond 5 meters. The flaming monster likely only remained in fear and associated the corrupting aura from the seal with Lumion. At a certain level, Lumian didn't even need to activate or partially activate the Blackthorn symbol on his chest, nor did they need to be within five meters of Lumian for them to obviously feel his specialness and show conspicuous dread. Were there any other levels above these three? Lumian felt there should be at least one, at most three. For instance, the kind that wouldn't fear the partially activated Blackthorn symbol so much that they immediately fled. They would persist in attacking despite significant weakening. Or for example, the kind that were so high in level that they wouldn't react to the Blackthorn symbol at all. Therefore, while Lumian was delighted that he could scare off the three-faced monster and seemed capable of doing whatever he wanted in the dream ruins, he didn't dare to be careless, disregarding terrifying beings that might be higher in level than the three-faced monster. Just the flaming monster could incinerate him to ashes without being impacted by the partially activated Blackthorn symbol with its powerful long-range attack. With this in mind, Lumian hesitated for a moment before stealthily delving deeper into the dream ruins along the three-faced monster's escape route. He planned to scout the blood-colored peak and surrounding area today to gather information for the subsequent unlocking of the dream's secret. 
Along the way, he proceeded to a relatively concealed area less easily discovered, on guard against any monsters that might suddenly burst out. Perhaps because the three-faced monster had just passed by, frightening off the other monsters, Lumion didn't see a single person. He successfully passed collapsed buildings and gray gravel everywhere and arrived at the base of the blood-colored peak. There was still a circle of ruins, but unlike the outer layers, the buildings here hadn't collapsed, but seemed to have completed a warp reassembly as if they had a life of their own. They were interconnected, as if a strange thorny city wall had been built. The wall was dyed a faint grayish black. The windows and doors of the original buildings were embedded messily on its surface. Some were open, permitting one to see the shattered tables and chairs inside. Some were tightly shut, as if they couldn't be pulled open. Lumion scanned the area and gazed up at the blood-colored mountain behind the city wall. At this range, even with the heavy fog blanketing the sky and the dim light filtering into this realm, Lumion could see every detail of the mountain peak clearly. It was made of rocks and soil, no more than 30 meters tall, but it gave off a towering menace. The color on its surface was unnatural, neither the brownish-red of the rocks nor the reddish-brown of the soil. They seemed dyed at a later time, making it look sinister. According to Aurora's novels and paranormal magazines, this might be dyed red by human blood. Lumion thought. He raised his gaze higher and higher, glancing at the peak shrouded in thick fog. Suddenly, an unseen wind blew away some of the fog. The peak came into view. Sitting cross-legged was a giant four to five meters tall with three heads. He was naked and had three heads growing from his neck. One face left, revealing anger, greed, and hatred. Extremely evil. One face forward with a warped expression of pain and regret. The other face right, holy, with pity in its eyes. The giant had six arms stretching out at odd angles. Its entire body, including the three heads, was made of flesh and organ fragments stitched together with pus flowing everywhere. Especially, transparent blood-like tears dripped from the head facing Lumion. Seeing the giant, Lumion's mind buzzed as he heard a terrifying voice seeming infinitely far yet right beside him. His head felt as if it had been split open with an axe, and intense agony occupied his mind, robbing him of all thoughts. Thick and thin blood vessels protruded from his body surface, so red that they were about to be ignited. When Lumion woke up from his near-death state, he realized that he was curled up on the ground, rolling back and forth, as if this wasn't enough to resolve the pain in his body. His vision was blurry, stained with blood, and everything he saw was misty. In this state, Lumion felt that even the skinless monster could easily kill him. However, perhaps because the Blackthorn symbol had been completely activated, no person dared to enter this area. As for the giant at the summit of the blood-colored mountain, it was unknown if it couldn't leave or if it had been affected by the Blackthorn symbol and hadn't attacked Lumion, who had nearly lost control. After regaining his composure, Lumion stood up and noticed the linen shirt beneath his dark-colored jacket stained with blood and sweat. What the hell was that? The more he pondered it, the more dread crept in. With a mere glance, the Blackthorn symbol had flared to life and nearly overpowered him. It posed an even greater threat than wielding the dancer's might. He dared not recall the giant's visage, only deduce what he could from fractured impressions. An advanced variant of the three-faced monster. Sheer corruptive influence. Aura was right, there are sights not meant to be seen. It occupies the crimson mountaintop, the heart of this dreamscape in ruins. Does that signify its integral to the dream's mysteries? As his thoughts raced, Lumion forced down the urge to gaze up at the mountain's summit. If he took another look, it would spell certain death. He resolved to withdraw for now and return to the real world to recover. He would resume his exploration at night. Lumion spun on his heel, ready to retrace his steps out of here, when a sudden clanging caught his ear. What's that? Curiosity seized him, and he devised a plan to sidle over for a peek. Of course, he would proceed judiciously, not hastily or rashly. He tucked himself into a half-collapsed building facing the city wall to recoup his spirituality. After a time, Lumion again performed the mysterious sacrificial dance. He seemed to morph into a high priest of the hidden existence, gratifying that existence with movements that could marshal the ambient forces of nature. When a burning sensation flared in his chest, Lumion halted and honed in on the intermittent clanging. Skirting the blood-hued mountain crest and dilapidated city wall, dancing anew, he spied an orange glimmer through a half-open brownish-red wooden door in the wall. A flickering orange flame shone behind a half-open wooden door. Clang, clang, clang. The figure in the room was reflected in a grimy, diagonal glass window above. It looked humanoid, but too spindly in the dim light. In that moment, the figure raised a hammer-like object and smashed it down with formidable might. Clang, another metallic clash rang out, crisp and ominous. A blacksmith, 
There's a blacksmith in these ruins, Lumian guessed, relying on his knowledge. Trusting that the thorn emblem on his chest hadn't vanished yet, he dropped into a crouch and darted to the glass. He turned and peered in. Though Lumian's eyes weren't healed, and his vision unclear, he could just make out the scene beyond the city wall. Shattered furniture and debris littered the space. In the center was a stove, its top half gone, housing a fire. On top, an iron plate cobbled together, mismatched. A pewter black dirk lay on the plate, twice as long as a normal dagger, strange patterns coating its surface. Just looking at it made Lumian dizzy. Clang. The figure pounded the dirk like a skilled blacksmith, hammer blows ringing out in a steady beat. He wore a black robe, decay marring the side of its face visible to Lumian, even revealing bone in places. Another monster. Is it picking up where it left off when it was still human? That dirk isn't run of the mill. It's a tad sinister. I wonder if it's a sealed artifact or a bayonder weapon, Lumian thought. He was less than three meters from the rotting blacksmith, but the other party didn't seem to detect the blackthorn symbol on his chest. He kept pounding the dirk in silence. Given that the blackthorn symbol was about to vanish, Lumian recoiled and tiptoed away from the window. He had only taken a few steps when the searing sensation in his chest disappeared. The next moment, a creaking sound came from behind him. Lumian whipped around and saw the mahogany door swing open. The black-robed blacksmith emerged. There were four or five putrid gashes on his face that bared its bones. Half of his left eyeball dangled from its eye socket. It looked like a corpse that had been dead for some time. He clutched the hammer in his right hand and the pewter black dirk in his left. Lumian's reflection glinted in his lifeless eyes. FCK. Lumian couldn't help cursing. He instantly grasped the situation. The blacksmith monster had clearly been influenced by the blackthorn symbol, so he had been quietly pounding the malicious dirk, feigning nonchalance. When the blackthorn symbol disappeared, he immediately seized his weapon and emerged to hunt him. How cunning. Chapter 85, Appropriating. As soon as Lumian confirmed the situation, he pivoted on his heel and bolted. He couldn't leverage the environment here, and he was clueless about the blacksmith monster's abilities. What choice did he have but to run? Once he escaped to the nearest natural trap and it was still in hot pursuit, he'd consider counterattacking. Fud fud fud. Lumian didn't run in a straight line but snaked left and right in an S-shape. He worried it might predict his trajectory and hurl a fireball or long-range weapon. The old Lumian could run on a curve, but he'd have to throttle back at points. Otherwise, his body couldn't take it and he'd eat dirt. Things were different now. He was extremely limber, far beyond ordinary humans. His muscles and tendons easily let him arch his body in a smooth semicircle. With this move, he felt that unless the blacksmith monster had special abilities, he should reach the ruins seven to eight meters away. Suddenly, dread gripped his heart with premonition. Without thinking, Lumian plunged forward, riding his momentum. Sizzling, sharp pain seared his back. The evil pewter black dirk had sliced him, spurting bright red blood. The blacksmith monster had caught up in a single bound and swung its weapon. It seemed to have shortened over a dozen steps to one. Lumian endured the pain and rolled twice before finally touching a half-collapsed building. He vaulted in with a whoosh. Slithering through the walls and furnishings as cover, he bolted out the back entrance. Being back in this area was like a tiger returning to the deep mountains or a trout in a river. He adeptly wove through the ruins and buildings, at times circling around, other times going straight. Within ten seconds, he arrived at a natural snare he had spotted earlier. He ducked behind the roof that had slid to the ground and held on for the blacksmith monster to turn up. He didn't try the sacrificial dance because he felt there wasn't enough time. The other side clearly had some distinctive tracking prowess. As time passed, Lumian didn't spot the blacksmith monster, nor did he catch any sound approaching. He didn't note any indistinct footprints around him. It didn't chase after me. Lumian couldn't help but frown. He was glad, but he also felt this situation was a bit odd. After some thought, he guessed the blacksmith monster couldn't leave the city wall, so the moment he went into the building ruins, it gave up chasing him. Considering he had already suffered two injuries and was drained, Lumian decided not to explore further. Leveraging his terrifying flexibility, he treated the wound on his back and headed toward the edge of the ruins. After walking a long time, he looked at the familiar collapsed buildings and suddenly felt something was off. It has already been more than enough time to finish a meal. The dream ruins aren't especially large. I should be able to walk out in a straight line. Why haven't I escaped yet? The more Lumian contemplated it, the more he sensed that something was amiss. His thoughts were becoming foggy and disjointed, as if severe exhaustion was overtaking him or he was about to drift off to sleep. He forced himself to focus, relying on his hunter abilities to locate the path, hoping to get out of these ruins immediately. 
However, as he walked, he couldn't help periodically slipping into a daze. Eventually, he didn't even know what he was doing. After an indeterminate amount of time, Lumian's eyes abruptly reflected the flickering orange glow of a fire. He found himself back by the city wall and the chamber where the blacksmith monster was. Not good. I'm under its influence. No wonder. It didn't. Chase me. It seems. I can't force my way. Out. I can. Only. Think of a solution. Starting. With that monster. Lumian's thoughts slowed and fogged. As he approached the chamber involuntarily, he struggled to perform the mysterious sacrificial dance. Since he had to confront the blacksmith monster, his greatest reliance was the black thorn symbol on his chest. He had to activate it immediately. Amid the sonorous but intermittent noises from within, Lumian saw the door emitting orange flames open. The monster in a black robe holding a pewter black dirk and hammer appeared in the doorway. Unlike before, much of the rotting marks on its face had vanished, and fresh flesh had grown over the wounds that exposed its bones. Its eyes lit up as it gazed at Lumian with undisguised greed and amusement. This made it appear more human than zombie. At the same time, Lumian saw himself reflected in the glass window. His face was pale, and his eyes were dull. Some of his skin showed signs of decay. He looked more like a zombie than a human. Lumian instantly realized the truth. I will. Take its place. It will. Walk out. As a human. Lumian, who didn't know what ability had affected him or when he had encountered the anomaly, only had one thought. Giving it his all by finishing the sacrificial dance and partially activating the blackthorn symbol on his chest. He slowly but firmly began his dance, but the blacksmith monster didn't seize the opportunity to attack. It seemed to be patiently waiting for the outcome, afraid that additional actions would impact its fate. As he edged closer and danced each step, Lumian's vision grew increasingly blurry. He only knew that the blacksmith monster's smile was becoming more and more human. After advancing some distance, Lumian's mind buzzed. He heard a terrifying sound that seemed to come from an infinite distance yet also seemed close at hand. This wasn't clear enough and was very illusory. It only caused some disorder in his mind, preventing him from experiencing a near-death experience. Amid his grogginess, Lumian's thoughts cleared and his vision returned to normal. He felt a burning sensation in his chest and knew that the partially activated blackthorn symbol meant trouble. Almost simultaneously, he saw the smile on the blacksmith monster's face freeze. Numerous silver and black warts protruded from the monster's face, head, and hands. The wicked dirk in its hand buzzed and vibrated violently, as if trembling in fear. Paw, amidst a crisp metallic snap, a jagged fracture shot across the pewter black dirk's demon-etched blade. The blacksmith monster crumbled into silver black warts and warped maggots crawling across its black robe. The maggots and warts stopped moving, turning into lifeless gray flesh. Lumian gawked at the scene, dumbstruck. It was as if the enemy had suddenly committed suicide mid-battle while he stood by helpless. After over ten seconds, he snorted at the fleshy lumps in bemused disbelief. So you dragged me here to attend your own funeral. You should have said so earlier. No need for all this pomp and show. I'd have gladly shown up and applauded your swan song. He strode over to the chunks of flesh the blacksmith monster had crumbled into and scrutinized them intently. Nothing else seemed amiss, save that the slightly cracked pewter black dirk still quivered minutely, like a wounded animal encountering its mortal foe. Lumian's heart raced as he looked down at his chest, sensing the blackthorn symbol beneath his clothes. He realized the truth and grabbed the pewter black dirk with his right hand. The evil dirk trembled vigorously but didn't struggle or resist. It was docile. As soon as he held it, the heat in his chest intensified. Something leaked out, resonating with the pewter black dirk. Amidst the metallic hum, Lumian grasped a greater understanding of the sinister dirk in his grip. It was a corrupted Bayonder weapon, gaining power and a semblance of life. In other words, Lumian hadn't encountered a blacksmith monster, the dirk was the true menace. The blacksmith monster was its puppet, or rather, wielder. It could gradually transform any living being who touched its cold steel and drew blood into a zombie, robbing them of will and reason. They would always clutch it and act on its desires. Those who were cut by it, spilling crimson, would have their destiny appropriated by its edge. When seizing one's fate, it could inflict no further harm. Just now, it had bartered the fate of the blacksmith monster becoming a puppet to exchange for Lumian leaving the wilderness as a human. If there was nothing to trade, he had to kill the target completely to strip a portion of his fate from him and store it in the dirk. This ability came from the dancer's corresponding sequence 5, Fate Appropriator. Therefore, after the corruption in Lumian's body was half-activated, it resonated with the evil Dirk through flesh and blood, letting some knowledge seep out. 
Otherwise, he could only get someone to use divination and figure out patterns to grasp the pewter black Dirk's abilities and characteristics. He could also rely on his repeated experiments to gather information. After sorting out the additional knowledge in his mind, Lumion looked at the evil Dirk that was still trembling in his hand and chuckled. Actually, I don't mind you appropriating some of my destiny, but you'll have to bear the consequences. If you can swap with my fate of being trapped in this time loop, I'll kneel and grovel before you three times. Tisk, but randomly appropriating destinies will only hurt you. The pewter black Dirk merely trembled, not daring to respond. Lumion now understood why the Dirk was so obedient. First, the half-activated Blackthorn symbol suppressed it. Second, encountering Lumion had traumatized the sentient weapon. Exhaling, Lumion said, From today onward, your name is Fate Appropriator Dirk. Got it. The Dirk bobbed up and down twice, as if nodding. Unfortunately, you're only a Bayonder weapon. Your power will gradually fade. You could have lasted two years, but now, severely damaged from your foolishness, you'll only survive half a year, Lumion said regretfully. In fact, he could replenish Fate Appropriator by extracting power from the corruption in his body, but that required finding someone to repair the crack. No sooner had he spoken than the heat in his chest quickly vanished. The minute was up, wasting no time. He hurled Fate Appropriator Dirk away as if it were red-hot coal. 